Welcome to Everything STEAM. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. As a physicist and structural engineer with Jacobs Engineering, I've made many connections with some bright individuals who are either working, studying, or self-taught and passionate about our particular topics of discussion. Based on the sounds that you just heard and the name of this episode, it's probably clear that this is all about amphibians. My guest and I will tackle evolution in the first segment just to get your feet wet, and then we'll become more focused and discuss the evolution of amphibians. And then to round out the episode, my guest will be sharing a specific example of amphibian evolution that he is truly fond of. Now, it's probably an appropriate time to introduce my guest star for this podcast, so please meet Dylan Jones. Dylan is a biologist and a science communicator with a passion for uncovering the secrets of biodiversity. His biology career has largely focused on the ecology of reptiles and amphibians, as well as understanding how and why species ranges change over time. As a science communicator, Dylan delves into topics such as wildlife conservation, evolutionary theory, and the incredible array of life on our planet. You can find him on Instagram under the handle at DylanTheBiologist. So, now that you've been introduced to my guest star and the topic of this podcast, we're going to head into the first segment where we plan to discuss one of science's most accepted theories, the theory of evolution. Cheers. Hey, Dylan. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. It was uh, World Frog Day yesterday, so I'm uh, I'm pretty, I don't know, pretty hopped up right now. (laughs) Great pun to start the podcast. I love it. It's that. all downhill from here. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty good, man. That's good. Um, I I actually just got um, well, not a new book, mm. but a used book. I got Ooh. um Project Hail Mary. Very excited. Um Matthew Broussard actually, I was hiking with him a couple weeks ago, mm. and he was like, You need to read if you haven't read this, you should. And I'm like, Well, I've read The Martian. He's like, Well, then you definitely need to read yeah. this book. So it just came in today. Really hype. Oh, um, sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, apologies to the listeners or the, I guess, the watchers of YouTube out there. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not using my normal equipment. I'm actually using my work laptop. Work, don't kill me for this. It's not going to be the best in terms of sound quality, but we're here for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. Work is what yeah. you got. Yeah, working with what we got. So this first segment, we're talking about evolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, I guess we could start on the broad sense, because first of all, physics, engineering, not a biologist, Mm -hmm. we got a biologist here. So Dylan, (laughs) run me through it, man. What is evolution? And then I can add some quirky things as we go. Yeah, for sure. It's evolution. I I just define it as change over time. If, If we just start at that basic principle of its change in an organism over some period of time. We often think of like uh, natural selection or Darwin's finches all having different beak sizes on different islands because the seeds are different sizes and they need you know bigger beaks to crack bigger seeds. Um, but that's just an example of change. Uh, it's and it's over time and that's in a case of a morphological uh, morphologic character, their their beak. But it can also be something like their genes. It could be uh, their behavior changing over time. So uh, that, that's why I kind of put it all down to just it's change over time depends on how you look at it. <laughs> that's so true. And it like, uh, I guess, comes in, in different flavors. You have like the stuff that's going on with the DNA and then the stuff that you have after you you do reproduce because you have the recombination and mutation that's dealing with the the hereditary aspect. And then you then try to replicate that as much as possible, make a bunch of offspring. And then that's when like natural selection occurs. So you get all of these crazy things going on. It could be, it could be climate toxins, oh, you know, yeah. competition, so much, so many different things. And I mean, um, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, like in, in my specific focus, it's biogeography. So it's like, I, I study how and why species are where they are today. It's like, it's like, why are there so many amphibians down in Costa Rica? Like that's like a, you know, but it's, you actually pair that with, you know, millions of years of evolutionary history to get that answer. So it's, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's like what you're saying. Evolution can just be whatever you look at. That, that's what's cool about it though. Yeah, it's extremely involved. And I guess, especially with, with what you do, I mean, you have to be very in tune to like, like geology and, mm-hmm. you know, geologic time too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was actually the most surprising thing is 
how much I've had to learn about uh, plate tectonics or uh, how mountain ranges form just to figure out of like, you know, why is that salamander looking that way? It's, 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 it's super, super weird, <laughs> but oh, it, it's fun. It's fun. It, it, it really, I, I'm actually noticing now when I go out to places, I can much better take a guess as to what is that? And why did that form? Why do those mountains look like that? I don't know. It's, it's, it's cool. Oh, most definitely. So I have a question for you. And I mm -hmm. think this is something that we really haven't touched on in the podcast. Mm -hmm. And there is a, I guess, I don't want to say it like this, but like there's like a tier in terms mm -hmm. of evolution. There's micro and macro. So maybe right. you can touch on that for the audience. Yeah, yeah. So you'll hear uh, micro and macro evolution pretty often. And really it comes down to that that scale of time is usually how I lump them together, where microevolution is stuff that is happening uh, kind of in the last few thousand years. So that is uh, the like the classic example of the uh, the peppered moth turning uh, you know uh, black because of pollution in, during the industrial era. That's a classic example. The moths used to be mostly white and now they're mostly black during that time. So that's like a good example of microevolution. It's not a new species. It's it's no major change, but it's it happened within a few generations. Um, macroevolution is the stuff that you'll hear that goes like millions of years over time. Uh, so this is like entire new species, entire new clades. It's like, when did the mammals split off from uh, like early reptiles and, and stuff like that. So, so that's like the macro evolution. That's when you start hearing words like Jurassic and like Paleozoic and all of these different epochs and eras that uh, I think every biologist struggles to keep the order of. So, <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. So, one way I guess, and I guess, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that people can also use the distinction between micro and macro is that in the in terms of micro evolution, everything can um, reproduce with one another. But then the macro is where you get where get to a point where you really can't intermingle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like more, speciation. More yeah, it's it's one of those uh it's this is kind of like the fun thing and the frustrating thing about evolution is that everything <laughs> is intertwined. So it's like <clears throat> like time is usually pretty directly correlated to how different two things are. I mean, you know, if the difference between organisms that haven't been able to mate for 10,000 years is comparably small to an organism to a set of organisms that hasn't been able to mate for 300 million years you know there's a wide variety of differences there uh you know that that's like the difference between a uh, like a tiger and a, a lion versus a tree and a fish you know it's it's a huge difference it's a huge difference <laughs> yeah yeah, now that makes sense. So, okay, we've we've kind of we kind of covered some some broad definitions so far, and there are some terms out there that linger, you know, and are used colloquially. And um, it's, I don't know, I, I I have one that kind of gets not not on my nerves, but I I think it's just people that um don't really even know the surface level information about mm -hmm. evolution and maybe we can kind yeah. of help that those people out here uh one of those is the evolution mm. please enlighten us yeah so so the concept of de-evolution is where some taxa some organism uh evolves in what seems like a backward state where they go towards more primitive conditions and in like a, an extreme example this would be like a like a chicken de-evolving back into a t-rex um so maybe it you know its feathers aren't as big and it can't fly and starts to get you know 40 feet tall or whatever um we do see it in smaller doses but there's it, it, it's, it's a kind of improper a foundation for the term because things are always evolving. Uh, e even the most primitive organism, you know, we 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 colloquially say things like sharks or alligators haven't evolved or haven't changed in millions and millions of years. Uh, they're they're still evolving. They're they're still changing over time. Uh, the differences may be minor. Uh, they may be. I mean, it could be something as simple as like cellular respiration has been increasing over the last hundred million years or whatever. Uh, so it just they just don't look very different. And I, I think that's where people get into the idea of primitive means you look like a dinosaur, or you look like something else. But things don't de-evolve. They don't go back towards something necessarily. Yeah, mutation could occur where it goes back to the original state. But 
that's just an example of evolution, not de-evolution. Um, mm -hmm. Evolution is kind of a always plowing ahead forward type of concept. It, it never looks back. It just keeps going forward. It works with what it has. Yeah, so it's like, you know, we're we're very, very, very likely not going to de-evolve to have gills because uh, that's just very difficult to happen like it in theory yes it can happen in the infinite uh realm of possibilities it could happen uh but it's very 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 unlikely and even if it did it wouldn't be the same gills that our ancestors had they would be essentially new gills yeah right right what do you mean i can't fly i, I that's what <laughs> i want to evolve into come on <laughs> right right that that's actually been one of the so the funniest things b building on that Evolutionary biology and learning about this really, really ruined a lot of mythical creatures for me. So, <laughs> um, so like we, we talk about these concepts of you know what we just said, like you you work with what you got. Um, mm -hmm. And if you have uh, like like wings are a great example of this. So bird wings and bat wings, they both formed from what is arms and hands, um, but they formed in very different ways uh, where the, the birds more, uh, everything kind of got truncated and a little bit more, uh, like I, I'm making this, I, I don't know how to communicate what this is on a audio format uh, where the fingers are all kind of squished together. Uh, whereas bats are, uh, you know, they have the webbing between all of their digits. Now, when you look at something like a mythical creature, like a griffin or something, and the wings are just sprouting out of their back, it's like, what did they have out of there? Did they just have extra arms coming out of their back that evolved into wings? Like, it doesn't make sense because they are presumably tetrapods. They have four limbs. Uh, but with the addition of uh, wings, now that's six things. So I, I guess you could say a griffin is a... I, this is a... Wow, this is a big tangent. Um, but I would say a griffin <laughs> is a... Is a tech, yeah, whatever. It's a hexapod. It's got six. Um, I think people like the label things as like a like progression. Mm -hmm. um, I don't find it as progression. It's just more like blind success yeah. or random success. You know, with oh, yeah. working with what you got. That's that's. <laughs> yeah. we, can't, we can't we can't like emphasize that anymore. But um, yeah, most definitely. Oh yeah. Is there yeah. any other things that you would like to uh, talk about that that like come up in terms of evolution ev evolutionary biology? Yeah, may maybe not necessarily a term, but there is this, um, it, it actually fits in really well with what you said about evolution kind of blindly stumbling and getting successful on accident. Um, <laughs> there's, there's this notion, and I think everyone is guilty of it, and it's seeing an organism in the wild and assuming that it's, it's perfectly adapted for that environment. Uh, you, and you hear this on like every nature documentary, it's like, you know, the cheetah in the bush is perfectly adapted for speed. And it's, well, you know, the thing is, it's nothing is really perfectly adapted. It's just that it has certain adaptations that are really good for what it does, but it could be much faster. It could be a much stronger organism. It could be better, but it's working with what it has. It has its own limitations. Um, like, yeah, there are super fast humans and, you know, no one's saying like, oh, Usain Bolt is uh, perfectly adapted for speed. You know, it's, <laughs> he, he could be more. I mean, there's lots of organisms oh, yeah. that are way faster. Um, Definitely. But it's just seeing some organism and saying, oh, that is perfectly adapted. And every adaptation it has is specifically meant for the environment that it lives in is, is not really true. Uh, there are, you know, vestigial organs. We see them all over the place, uh, things that used to be useful but are not. Uh, and they're still there, though, you know, the, the appendix isn't perfectly adapted for rupturing in the emergency room. Uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really... Uh, always makes sense but uh, it, it's, a, it's a concept that I, I was luckily drilled into very very early on in my like evolution career and it's really helped me uh beyond evolution just looking at an organism and trying to understand its traits and like why does it have that in this environment yeah i think there's still some people that can do this but like mm -hmm. i attribute it more as a, of a vestigial trait and that is wiggling your ears because oh, we yeah. don't have to communicate via just body language anymore <laughs> i mean we still do don't get me wrong it's oh, yeah. very important but being able to have like speech is was kind of way more important. So less people, I don't think, can do that, right? 
Right, exactly. And it's, uh, you know, it, this is actually a very fun uh, thing you can do with like classroom, like, like kids and whatnot, is is have them act like they're aliens and they have to describe an organism and exactly what its traits are used for. And it's 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 going into it with that mindset because in essence, we are the aliens looking at a, I don't know, like an elephant and trying to figure out why does it have those tusks? And, you know, maybe we can get the right answer, but maybe we get the wrong answer. And it's, it, it's fun to think about it that way because then you realize it's like if we did that with humans, you know, we can make up some like crazy crazy answers uh you know like the the ears are adapted to like swimming fast or something because they saw one like wiggle in the water when someone was swimming you know it's like ah they must be rudders or i don't know it's it's you know you can make up anything like that's that's the cool thing uh but yeah it's, it's something to keep in mind whenever you're looking at things is that maybe that thing is just there because it's just uh there uh and it maybe its ancestors used it and it doesn't use it anymore very true. Very true. Uh, I think the last thing that we should talk about before we roll into our first commercial break is, I guess, answering the, the question, well, you answering the question, what, why do people think that mutations are just bad and explain why they're not just bad? Yeah, m- mutations have gotten a pretty bad rap. Um, mm-hmm. And and I, I think some of it is, I mean, a, a lot of it is definitely just mass media. Um, you know, you you hear like a like like the X Men or something, and it's like a single <laughs> mutation in their genome, and it's like that's nothing. That's there's there's tons of single mutations like that that happens all the time. You probably have a few million in yourself. Um, but it's it's and also things like uh, medically like cancer or uh, seeing like oh this mutation caused a, uh, a a a really bad disease, really bad chronic disease or something. And so that's the cases we focus on, but mutations are the base unit for all diversity of life on this planet. Um, you know, the, the, the reason that we have frogs and bears and giant trees is all because of single mutations over the course of billions of years. Uh, so it, it's super, super, super cool to like just think that all of this started from just four little base pairs uh, changing over time and duplicating and then kind of melding together and and then just becoming every single living thing we see today. Uh, so so mutations are uh, and, and I guess also we, sh- we should mention that most mutations are just completely removed when they occur um, because we have most bodies have like really good DNA fixing processes. They yeah. look for actively bad me- or just mutations and try to remove them. Uh, so uh, yes, in the grand scheme of things, I guess the majority of them are bad, but the majority of them never even affect anything because they're just removed. Um, so uh, honestly, I probably would have answered it different by saying like, hey, look, I mean, we do have some mutations that you could technically say are bad, but then there's others that are good, like, you know, people having blue eyes or, yeah. um, you know, or I guess beating lactose intolerance. I mean, there's there's many different ways that you know we've mutated, and it's been good. <laughs> yeah, right. Like cheese. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can eat cheese. Cool. Sorry for the people that can't. Maybe someday your ancestors will be able to. I I apologize. <laughs> but I think we're gonna run into our first commercial break, and then whenever we come back, we're gonna be talking about amphibian evolution. So stick around. All right, we're back. This is segment two, and we're talking about amphibian evolution. And I guess we'll just cut right to it because it's kind of the obvious question that we should really start out with is like, Dylan, where did this all start? And not, we don't, not from the beginning, not, we're not doing the big bang thing. We're, mm-hmm, we're mm-hmm. you know, evolution, amphibians, where did it start? Yeah, so instead of going back 4 billion years, we'll go back or however it was, we'll go back 400 million, we'll go a tenth of the way and turn back around. Um, Sweet. So about, yeah, about 360 to 400 million years ago, um, all, all these million years are going to be estimates, but that's mm. when we got the first uh, amphibians, the, the ancestors to all of the some 8,000 species of amphibians that we have today. And it was, you know, I'd love to say where, but it is very difficult to say where. We can say uh, (laughs) Pangaea. Um, uh, So that that doesn't really help much. But yeah, during uh, during this time, amphibians rose out from a, you know, some group that had a common ancestor with fish. They were uh, very much so in the water. And the amphibians were the first tetrapods, so the the, the four-limbed animals uh, that, that really, really got onto land. So we, we hear of like some of the lobe fin fishes, uh, the most famous like Pictolic. Um, yeah. That, 
Yeah, that did kind of go on to land. Uh, and that is what paved the way for amphibians to eventually colonize land. But uh, amphibians are still famously, uh, amphibios means living double life, is that they uh, need to be in the water. They need to have water as a main stage. Uh, so this is where I, I just love amphibian uh, evolutionary history because it, it, it's so, so old. And just the <laughs> origins of it are so cool. It's like, get out of the water, get onto land. You need to get all of these different uh, traits to be able to survive on that. First, you just need to not die from drying out. Like that's right. the thing, you know, fish are just in the water. They don't need to worry about drying out as much because they're in the water all the time. Uh, but the amphibians are not. So uh, many, many early amphibians were probably uh, like half in the water. I, there, there's a term for it where they're just kind of, they're they're above land, they're, they're breathing air, you know, they're past that gill stage. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, but then they're just in the water the whole time so they don't uh, completely dry out and die. Is it like um, a good uh, indicator to that? Like whenever you're looking at the fossil record, uh, where their um, their quote unquote like blow holes transition? Mm. Yeah, because like There's, how like yeah. fish breathe like mm -hmm. in through and uh, like circulate the oxygen into their swim bladders mm -hmm. and stuff. That that position has like changed over time to where it finally became more or less in the uh, area of like a snout. Mm -hmm. There, there's something with that, and I'm really struggling to remember it because also with amphibians, it gets so messy because <laughs> they have that. The, the, they have the larval stage, which makes it even more complicated because they Ooh, have yeah. gills at some point. They many, many species have gills, uh, not all, because amphibians are crazy. Uh, but many have gills at some point in their life stage, and then they completely just uh, stuck into themselves. Basically, the gills degrade, go away, and are replaced with lungs. It's, it's also if you ever have the chance to like watch a, a, a tadpole develop from like a single-celled egg all the way up through all the they're they're called Gosner stages, and it's just when they get their gills, when they get like when they can move around, Ooh. when they're it, it is one of the coolest things you could possibly do i stayed up in a lab for 48 hours straight on just coffee taking pictures of these ones that we found in the field and it's it's just like ah this is so cool because you, you see it grow right before your eyes it's it's, it's the craziest thing um, that is awesome but but do it because you're going to see like th this organism develop. Uh, you'll start to see when the neurons actually fire. You'll start to see the gills coming out, and they're these big tendri tendrilinous tendr They look like tendrils yeah. <laughs> coming out, and then they go back in and they start to get their first breath. And you start, you know, it's just the coolest thing. I, I always recommend doing it if you can. But to get to that, yeah, it's amphibians kind of the theme with anything is that they just make everything so complex and so complicated. Uh, awesome. But it's cool. Yeah. So they were like, so the, these mm -hmm. tetrapods, they were mm -hmm. the first animals on land, correct? Because what was on land before that, or it, at that time and before was some arthropods mm -hmm. and of course, uh, you know, fungus and of course some plants, right? Yeah, it was some early plants, uh, a few of your uh, insects, and then, uh, yeah, so so tetrapods, uh, I mean, every human is a tetrapod. It's mm -hmm. just the four-limbed animals. Um, yeah. Which is, like, most of the time when you think of an animal, it's it's going to be a tetrapod, but, uh, you know, and then there's fish, and then it's like, okay, yeah, we, we kind of ignore those, and then somehow, and also, yeah, snakes are considered a tetrapod, even though they have no limbs, but... Yeah, they're uh, yeah they're they're lumped in there. Dude, it's the evolution. <laughs> I know they're they're grandfathered in. Um, so, <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. So the tetrapods were like the the first like real land animals, as we kind of put it. Yeah, and this is like Devonian period. So we're talking like yeah. Gondwana as like the one of the supercontinents in that time? Yeah, so around that time, it would be Gondwana and Pangaea. They were starting to split. I mean, it you know, took hundreds of millions of years to fully split. But uh, Gondwana is the the southern half, which is what ended up oh, being yeah. like uh, Africa, Australia, uh, South America. And then Laurasia is the, the northern half, which ended up being mm. uh, like, well, Asia, Europe, uh, North America, that type of stuff. But it's, it's, it's a messy history, lots of... Uh, it's lots of connections, which we'll definitely get into, uh, but it, it's a very cool history. There, there's some awesome visualizations online to kind of help cement all this. Gotcha. Okay, so this is all pre-amniote evolution, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. the, yeah, so the, 
that's that's a good segue the amniotes <laughs> hey <laughs> um uh, Amniotes are basically the, the egg layers, um, and that's kind of what we think about when we think of amniotes is they have eggs, but the amphibians, when they colonized land and they started to spread out, um, other organisms did too, and it was a little bit of a problem because amphibians still lay eggs, just like fish lay eggs, many fish lay eggs, um, but when you're on land, it is much easier to dry out. You're not completely mm -hmm. submerged in water. So the amniote was, uh, had, had evolved uh, and basically in response to this. So uh, they needed to not dry out as much. So the amniotic sac, as well as many, many later uh, variations of the egg, ended up evolving so that there could still be gas transfer uh, between the developing organism and the outside area, but they could also be protected from drying out. Um, hence why the inside of a chicken egg is is wet so yeah <laughs> right right oh oh yeah right i think the dimetrodon is one of the most popular you know amniotes that kind yeah. of you know brought forth uh eggs yeah in it, was, it, was, it was my favorite growing up yeah <laughs> like the dimetrodon was always my favorite <laughs> Nice. Um, yeah, and it's super cool. So, like, some of the most early eggs, uh, they they looked more like sacks, kind of leathery oh, leather, sacks. Yeah. yeah, which is actually what uh, a lot of uh, your snake eggs look like today. Uh, so, if you've ever, you know, had the fortune of seeing snake eggs, they are leathery, and they'll actually deflate after the snake is uh, uh, hatched. I guess. I need to like. I need to actually look at a picture mm -hmm. of this. <laughs> oh, it's it's wild. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, snake breeders out there, and there there's like thousands of hours of videos of them using razor blades to help open up the snake's uh, uh, egg. Like they'll just cut it open. It's 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 a super weird looking thing because they look. Oh hard. wow! Yeah, it's super cool. Um, ah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to. <laughs> I, I bred snakes in like when I was a teenager. So it was. Uh, it's like ah, here's you know. These eggs look like dinosaur eggs, you know. <laughs> this is cool. Um, actually, I think okay. the dinosaur eggs might have been hard shelled, uh, but now I'm, that's outside so, of my realm. So we have the pre amniotes, the amniotes come along, mm -hmm. um, and we're kind of heading out of the Devonian more towards the Carboniferous. Do you want to mm -hmm. take us through what kind of happened in the Carboniferous period? Yeah, so up until this point, there was, uh, how do I put it? Like, like plant life was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The entire planet was just covered in plants. It was just like a giant rainforest. Uh, so it's super where we cool, get but... most of our fossil fuels. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because of a giant collapse of the rainforest. So all of our like uh, our, our coal or fossil fuels, uh, a lot of that comes from this ancient rainforest that ultimately collapsed. And this led to crazy diversification. Uh, so this was so if, if amphibians were already around before that, they were already around for, uh, I, I think, around 100 million, 150 million years at this point, um, yeah. if I'm getting my time periods right. So they had a long time to evolve. So I think the Permian period or the per the Great mm -hmm. Dying was 250 million years ago. And mm -hmm. if we look at the the late Devonian, whenever, you know, mm -hmm. they kind of sprung up the what the uh, Temnospondyls. Mm -hmm. the tennis bundles that was like 360 so right eh, about 100 100 million years yeah yeah it's, it's 100 yeah exactly but uh the great dying was a huge part of it uh yeah right lots of stuff died lots of organisms died uh you know we we, we talk about that big extinction 65 million years ago uh well even before that there was another big one uh there's <laughs> lots of there, there's been several mass extinctions so but yeah so during this time this is actually when the amniotes really uh developed because the earth got drier uh for to to kind of bring it down the earth got drier uh because of well a loss of rainforest a loss of something that can actually keep humidity and keep moisture in on the planet so a lot of amphibians died out some survived of course because we still have amphibians today or i should say ancestor to amphibians survived um but also other organisms evolved. So this is when this around the same time is when the um, let me make sure I'm getting my timelines right. This is when reptiles really started to come into fruition. So your snakes and rep, uh, snakes and lizards they evolved around 170 million years ago. Uh, so mm -hmm. not too crazy long after that. Um, they the I believe the crown reptiles were 300 million years ago, but a lot of it kind of gets muddied. Um, mm -hmm. But then you have your uh, your 
your, I mean, this is where we start to see birds and mammals and stuff start to rise over the next 100 million years or so. Um, but it's, it's, it's a really crazy dynamic period where, I mean, over the course of millions of years, there's just this mass sort of turnover of life going on on this planet where it was just massive rainforest now it's a little bit more temperate maybe uh, uh some other life is going to come into play and fill in the little gaps where the rainforest used to kind of uh, predominate i can maybe help ring mm -hmm. ring a bell with these uh time periods so mm -hmm. the late devonian we see these yep. um we see them arise out of like you know tetrapods etc and then mm -hmm. we get into the carboniferous the carboniferous happens for a little bit and then we have the permian and the Permian ends 250 million years ago. And then between the Great Dying and the KPG, you have the Jurassic and Triassic uh, periods. Right. So that's, and so that, that boundary where you see a rise of mammals and the fall of, of, of reptilians, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the, the paleogene, the, you know, mm -hmm. the KPG paleogenes after that. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and yeah, it was during that time because mammals were, uh, they were like proto mammals way back when, but, mm -hmm. but they didn't really come to fruition until that KT boundary, um, yeah. which is, uh, which that's, you know, for, uh, put put into every like school kid's head. That that's when the big asteroid hit the planet. <laughs> and, and yeah, but but uh, the, the classical thought is that mammals really diversified mammals diversified from there because uh, mainly like proto rodents, more or less, they were smaller organisms that could more easily survive in this like, uh, might be dramatic to call it hellish landscape, but I'll call it that, uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but between that, that like mm -hmm. long time period of the 360 million years, uh, years ago to about like mm -hmm. 110, you had the tennis bundles, mm -hmm. like completely diversified. Like it was a huge yeah. group, it, it, like, ruled ruled the earth for a long time oh yeah they, they were everywhere and and it's they're, they're in a really weird spot because we're not 100 percent sure they were, they were definitely something within amphibians that that's kind of where we're mostly pretty sure about um depending but but where it gets messy is if they were a group that ended up evolving into all of the amphibians that we have today or if they were a completely separate offshoot so mm. amphibians today are split into frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians. Those are our three major groupings. Um, the history of those is a little bit murky, but we're, we're, we're pretty confident about it now. And it, it's, it's just unclear if there was a, you know, a fourth branch shooting off that was the, uh, the Temnospondyls, or if the Temnospondyls were even before those three groups and were you mm. know, the, the common ancestor to all of them. But yeah, no, they're a huge group and there's some amazing visualizations of them online. Uh, like if you like, it's such a great Wikipedia binge because there's all these cool artist visualizations, and they have crazy looking skulls. So they're just they're super super cool organisms. Um, Neat. But yeah, Neat. yeah, yeah. They're they're super cool. It's just uh, it's you know, it's hard to figure out what something was 300 billion years ago. Of course. Yeah, through that. Um, I do have a really interesting, I guess, mm -hmm. fun fact. Uh, is that well. Of course, I'm sure you would have gone to this anyways, is, is that amphibians, there's no marine amphibians today. Mm -hmm. um, but if 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 this is true, if the, the Temnospondyls are part of the amphibian lineage of some sort, mm -hmm. um, there was some that were, you know, discovered in marine deposits. So they, they did have some marine ancestors. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason why they know that is because of lateral systems. And we see lateral systems in um, aquatic marine life, specifically like lampreys or uh, hagfish. And then also the more famous uh, portion of or examples are sharks and rays. And I can't remember the exact name for what sharks and rays have, but they have pressure and movement mm -hmm. detection, but they also have electromagnetic detection, which is yeah. really cool. Uh, of course, they didn't have that, but uh, you know, I just like to give a shout out to sharks and rays because that's that's pretty cool. But yeah, oh, they yeah. they definitely had like um, uh, cilia that mm -hmm. were at the end of these these pores of the lateral system that, that would go through um, their their skin, and whenever the cilia would move, it would of course create like an impulse, and they would you know feel that detection. They would create a detection. Yeah, pretty neat oh, stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, it's super cool. It, like it does make me think about. What what would that what would it be like if we still had them around, uh, you know? Because yeah. like 
marine amphibians would be just so cool. Like, I could just imagine, you know, may maybe there's a part of me that's hoping there's one Tendospondyl at the bottom of the Marianas Trench or whatever. Uh, that'd be <laughs> cool, um, you know? Uh, but yeah, it, it is weird. Like, when you, when you actually really think about it, how there is no marine amphibians whatsoever. The, the closest we have is like the marine toad, which is a misnomer because they're just, you can find them on the beaches. They're, they don't really go into the salt. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because this is the the, the amphibians, they're, they're worried about drying out a lot, and seawater is not really conducive to that. But um, it, it is interesting where if you think about things like mammals, which evolved um, much, much later than the amphibians did, they mm -hmm. were out of the land, and then they went back into the water. Um, and if you even look at it with other groups, like, like turtles have done this, uh, where they've been, you know, they... There are still marine turtles that are still around nowadays, as well as the terrestrial ones. And I mean, even with birds, there's marine birds that are predominantly in the saltwater. But it's uh, amphibians uh, kind of going back to like, you know, you're working with what you got. I guess that's like the theme here is that amphibians have this uh, adaptation where they need to stay moist. They really need to maintain water. That's incredibly important to their physiology and well-being. So the, the evolutionary steps to go back into salt water or to get into that is just so, it, it's a huge barrier for them to overcome evolutionarily speaking. Um, so it's, it's, it's just interesting to see that where other groups like the, the mammals, the birds, uh, they've already kind of solved that issue. They don't really worry about drying out anywhere near as much as amphibians. We have very thick epidermis that actually you know, holds in that moisture. And we, uh, mm. we try to conserve our water best we can. And we're, we're terrible at it. Like as humans compared to other organisms, we're awful at conserving water. Um, if you look at like desert rats or uh, most reptiles for that matter, but in amphibians, it's, it's, it's at a whole other level. It's, it's at a whole other level. That's so true. That's so true. That's another one of those like key differences between the Temnos bundles mm -hmm. and like uh, present day amphibians is like how their skin was made up. Mm -hmm. The Temnos bundles were scaly and that's yeah. not how amphibians are today. <laughs> no, no. I mean, there's, there's a part of me that's like, a, why didn't the toads ever evolve to get into the water? Because they're a little bit, but it's still, I don't know, that's just the way it works. You know, you can't, can't have everything, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, true. So in, in this uh, segment, we've kind of mm -hmm. talked more along like the really, really distant past. But um, what are you seeing um, in terms of evolution with the amphibians, I guess, more more present day, maybe more like, um, you know, Pliocene forward or like mm -hmm. the glaciation periods, you know, like the last glaciation period, et cetera. What do you what do you see? Yeah. So what what, what you see over this time is. You see a lot of land bridge connections. So as as water levels uh, kind of fluctuate, they go up, they go down. Uh, when they're lower, you have more land bridges usually. So these are ways for amphibians uh, over the course of tens of thousands, maybe even millions of years, to move from one area to another. Uh, Panama is a really famous example. Uh, the land bridge between North America and South America. We also have the the Bering land bridge that goes mm -hmm. from uh, like Eastern Asia over to North America. And then there's also a few other smaller ones. Um, I know there was one between uh, Papua New Guinea and Australia. Uh, most islands have had it. Uh, I, I, I need to double check the exact timing of these tectonics, but also you see things like India crashing into Asia, uh, which is just like, like, so this is the thing. If you ever find a visualization of plate tectonics, you will just see India being all the way in the south and just making like a beeline. Uh, like, I think it's split off of Madagascar and it just beelines and just hits straight into uh, Asia. And that's why we have the Himalayas. Like, it's so cool to see that, oh, this is just like a, a tectonic plate just going. And then, boom, it's crushing into it and making mountains in a very fast period of time. Um, and that's also why they're so tall. They haven't had time to erode. Shout out to the Appalachians, because they're cool. Um, <laughs> yes. Also, yeah. But but yeah, so it, it's it's this time of fluctuations as and change. So while the land bridges are also changing, you also see mass climate change due to the glaciation periods. There are some fantastic visualizations of like salamander range estimations over the last 50,000 years. And it just fluctuates with the glaciers so much. And you see them going uh, north and south and north and south as, as a giant group. It's, it's so, so cool to see it. And the more you look into amphibians, the more you realize their entire evolutionary history 
has just been marked by these uh, glacial periods. Oh, interesting. So mm -hmm. how um, I so they are heavily in influenced just based on like their their migration, but like how about in terms of like um, like mass extinction within the like the amphibian um, realm? Yeah, I mean ma mass extinctions. Uh, I mean we're in one now. Uh, that's always <laughs> a, an important reminder. Yes. Um, right. Partially due to the climate change, uh, when things get hotter and drier, it's harder for generally it's harder for amphibians. Um, also, when habitats get destroyed due to climate change, amphibians are not exactly the most um, migratable species. Uh, mm -hmm. That's you know compared compared to birds, which are you know every year going from Canada to the equator and back. Or you know it's like they, they can migrate very easily. They can generally find homes, but amphibians, no, not really. They they're they don't migrate very fast uh, in terms mm -hmm. of organisms. Uh, so th they are more impacted by things like climate change. Uh, they are uh, in, in a very anthropocene, very modern era. They are in fact in, in, yeah, affected by things like uh, pollution. They are affected by, by humans a lot more and uh, we're losing a lot of amphibians. Uh, oh, also, that was gonna be my next question yeah. was what's the rates of today? like? Oh gosh! So there is a really uh, there's this publication which I, I've cited it a few times because it's so good. They actually so there's this concept called the background extinction rate. Um, it is so so cool. So uh, ex extinction isn't like a, an inherently bad thing uh, in, in the grand scheme of things. Most species are extinct. Uh, yeah, like right. It, like ninety nine point nine nine. Right. Right. And there is a rate that you can detect of, well, over the course of a thousand years, how many species do you expect to go extinct? Just a, across all life on Earth, how much do you expect? Uh, maybe if we just look at the amphibians, maybe we say over the course of a million years, we expect to lose, um, this is a complete guess, I don't know the actual number off the top of my head, but uh, maybe 10 to 20 species over the course of a million years, and then maybe we'll gain a few more due through diversification or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but there was a paper that looked at it and said, okay, well, historically, what is our estimated extinction rate and what is it now? And I, I if I'm remembering correctly, the it, it's higher, it's definitely higher, but it's either between 20 and a thousand times a higher right now. Uh, so wow. it's, yeah, it's, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy high number. You know, in, in my worldview, it's like, I don't necessarily care as much the exact number. It's more like, it's a lot higher. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a lot yeah. higher right now. Um, I feel like I've said I've seen claims of a million, but I don't know if that's a, an extreme, you know, guess. But it's it's still just massively high. So yeah, of course. I mean, even like twenty, it's like, oh, that's concerning. And then yeah. you're getting into the hundreds, and you're like, oh boy. Yeah, you know, like yeah. I get yeah, they just keep adding zeros onto that, and it keeps getting scarier and scarier. You know, it's Ooh. what's yeah. so uh, I'm. What is a life without amphibians? Just curious for for lay people. Yeah, so amphibians they, they encompass about eight thousand species around the world. Uh, so I, I always like to say there's a lot more amphibians than people realize, and they are important for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, it, it's always tough for me because I just like them, and that's why they're important to me. Of course. Um, but they are actually incredible bioindicators. So be, because of their uh, influence, because of how they are affected by water pollution, they can actually tell you ahead of time, hey, is this stream getting a lot of pollution? Is the, are the amphibians dying out? Uh, so that actually is a really good early indicator for how, are, how is the total ecosystem actually doing? Um, and I have been to areas that have almost no amphibians, and it is weird. It, it like w when they should be there. It's it's weird oh, when they're not. Like the North Folk Southern derailment like area. Yeah, in Ohio? yeah. yeah. Al although they, uh, I just saw that they found a hellbender out near Palestine. I um, did. Yeah. Like yeah, that blew my mind. Uh, well, no, it blew my mind more because the article was trying to say, like, this is a good thing. And I'm like, it's not a good thing. There's, the water's polluted. It's going to die. <laughs> like, this is yeah. bad. Get it out of there. Yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, but they're also really, really uh, important for insect control. So I, I think it's on an average night, uh, a frog, your, your standard frog could eat anywhere from like two to a hundred insects. Uh, so if, if you hate mosquitoes, I, I think a lot of people who live in like the American Southeast, so 
like the Gulf of yeah. Mexico and everything. They're, they're, they're pretty familiar with the concept of tree frogs being right next to your light, uh, eating the mosquitoes that get attracted to it and eating the moths and everything. Like that's just a common thing. Um, but yeah, so, so they're, they are important for those reasons. But uh, of course, we also have some incredible medical advantages from them. Many amphibians are uh, poisonous in some way. They actually secrete poisons through glands uh, or they sequester poisons, like in the case of poison dart frogs, because they mm. actually kind of steal the poison in a way uh, and concentrate it from ants. Uh, it's, it's so cool. Whoa. Like, yeah, this, that, it's so cool. And there's an entirely separate group that evolved it completely separately in Madagascar, the Mantellas, and they do it with termites instead of ants. It's just, ah, amphibians are so cool. Ah, that's cool. That's <laughs> like, cool. yeah, so uh, we, we have been able to synthesize a few things from the poisons of uh, different toads. Uh, there is like a famous example of a toad in the American Southwest that you can actually get DMT from it. It's not really worth it. Uh, it's just yeah. not, it's, it's like, it's too much of an effort to actually get it when you could just probably ask anyone hanging outside of a 7-Eleven. But, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, this is, it's so much effort and it's not worth it. Uh, yeah. So, but it's, it's just to say, it's, it's cool. Um, and also yeah. if you don't, since I's are right, you can die. I should say that. I should say that out of safety. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, safety, safety things. First. Safety. Mm -hmm. um, don't lick toads. But yeah. <laughs> And, and that's just brushing on like the, all, all these things are kind of in a way purely economical or purely like, how is this pragmatically good for me? But it, you can't ignore the, the insane cultural aspect that amphibians have put in. So many different cultures around the world have seen them as a symbol of rebirth. Many, many, many cultures have them as, I mean, direct gods, direct uh, symbols of larger things, larger issues. And it's, it's, it's hard to ignore that of frogs are important because they are important to people just culturally. They just love frogs. And, yeah. you know, that should be the case. It shouldn't just be a dollar values, and, <laughs> you know. Unfortunately, when you have to write grants, you have to make it, you know, so that people give you money to study right. things. But, yeah, I definitely. Know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about, I guess, a specific, what, species or a group <laughs> of... Group. Okay, cool. We're going to talk about a specific group of amphibians when we return. All right. Segment three. This is it. This is the final segment. And we have a specific tale. Not by me, by any chance. I'm going to be the, the bystander here. And I'm going to hand it over to Dylan so he can share this wonderful tale with you on a group of amphibians. Yeah, so we we were kind of planning out this uh, podcast. I thought of a great story. It's it's my favorite evolutionary story of the amphibians, and it's uh, so. Uh, Sam, do you like feet? I'm not a feet guy, Mike. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, you're gonna hate this story then. So this is about <laughs> the feet of salamanders, uh, and it is by far my. So this is the story that got me into uh, evolutionary biology. This is the story that, like, I've I've been reading papers and stuff about it for uh, honestly at this point maybe a decade, which is just wow. feels stupid to me. But so there, there's this group of salamanders. There's a genus called the Bolitoglossa salamanders. And they are about 130, 140 species total. Uh, so they are the most speciose group in the most speciose family of salamanders. Yeah, so uh, th this is like my favorite, by far my favorite group. So they're cool for many reasons. We're going to start off with why they're cool. Uh, so they're in the family Plethodontidae which is already super cool. These are the ones that are in uh, largely North America, a few in East Asia. Um, this is actually one of those kind of a land bridge situations as well, where a lot of early amphibians kind of crossed over from, uh, from, from Asia through the Bering Land Bridge into North America. And so... See, humans uh, aren't that special. They're yeah, we're not that special. Aren't that special. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, amphibians are doing it way before the humans did it. Uh, <laughs> So, so, so this group, so the, the whole family, they're they're lungless. So they, uh, so they they've de-evolved. Uh, we're looping back. No, they, oh, no. Uh, yeah. So they they don't have that 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 standard lungs like we think of a breathe in, breathe out. Uh, they actually breathe through their skin. Uh, it's it's super weird. So it's it's not even gills. It's called a cutaneous respiration. Yeah, it's 
it takes a bit to kind of cement it, but they just breathe through their skin. Sort of may, maybe breathe is not the right word. Uh, they conduct osmotic regulation through their skin. <laughs> like nice. Yeah, that's it's cool. just like that's just cool. I thought I always thought that was cool. Um, they also it's almost have... like they never leave the egg. You know? No, yeah, exactly. They're just always like that. And then, uh, I mean, well, with the eggs, some of them are direct developers, so they uh, they don't even mm -hmm. have the egg stage. They just skip that. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> They're so insane. Um, they also have incredibly complex um, mating dances. Oh. Th like, there is a beautiful paper that just breaks it all down. There's like 40 or 50 different types of dances, and they're all, you know, different. Uh, some of them will like rake their teeth on the back of the neck of the female to transplant pheromones. Um, they'll like waggle their tail. There's also really good videos of this. Uh, they'll do like spinning in circles. It, it, it's it's super complex. And at the end of it, uh, this is like this is this always blew my mind. Is that the male will drop a uh, how do I put it? A, like a like a sperm sack. I guess is the best way to put it um, on the ground. And then gently guide the female over it so that she can deposit the sperm into her uh, into in, onto the yeah. eggs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's 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 actually cool. This can actually delimit different species because if the male leads the female like a millimeter too far, it's gonna miss, and then oh. will impregnate the woman. Like it, it's crazy. It's crazy. So uh, you can have entire species groups that'll still be attracted to the dances, but then they won't continue forward because the, the male didn't bring her far enough or brought her a little bit too far. They're just like, they're just a weird group. They're a cool group. But then within them, there is Bolitoglossa as a genus. So, you know, family, Plethodontidae genus is mm -hmm. Bolitoglossa. So Bolitoglossa are the amphibians that actually made it south, uh, or the, sorry, the salamanders that made it south. If you look at most salamander ranges, it's almost all uh, what used to be Laurasia. So North America, Asia, Europe, that's the mm -hmm. vast, vast, vast majority of salamander rages. Um, they did evolve in Laurasia after Pangaea broke up. So that kind of makes sense. But if you look at it for Bolitoglossa, you'll see a kind of a tendril going through Central America and down into South America. Ooh. Yeah, and it's that story that I love. So Bolitoglossa, um, they also have these things called nasolabial grooves, nasolabial grooves, uh, these little okay. things on the front of their mouth that is used to like detect pheromones and it's, it makes them look really cute if you see a macro photo. But the Bolitoglossa are known for their webbed feet. So they have this really crazy webbing uh, between all of their toes and it's, it's pretty indicative throughout the entire genus. There's a couple species that don't really have as much webbing, but in general, all of them have this webbing. Uh, and for a long, long, long time, it was thought that they used that webbing to actually suction cup and climb up uh, leaves, basically. Okay. So they can just, you know, they basically kind of like a Mission Impossible thing where they mm -hmm. just keep suction cupping up the glass skyscraper, but it's, instead it's a giant leaf in the tropics. J just, just really, really cool. So uh, reading that and trying to understand why was, was always really, really important to me. I, I just loved it. But then I started looking into evolutionary history a little more. I started piecing together more papers. I started to understand the complicated jargon words in the papers and could really see what's going on. And what I found is that that webbing feet as being an adaptive trait isn't always, isn't, isn't exactly true. So there were some old papers done in, I believe, the 80s or 90s, where they actually tested the suction cup ability of these feet. Uh, basically, nice. they had the salamanders like hanging from a little pane of glass, and they like would see how long it would take them for them to fall. And it's like, oh, this one can suction really good. You know, uh, <laughs> in the 80s, it was much easier to get a grant. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, and that was the standard thing. But then you start looking into their evolutionary history a bit more, and there was many papers done by the uh, by the late great David Wake, who is like the salamander guy, the Bolitoglossa guy, uh, and then just a few other amazing authors throughout their history, kind of trying to understand well what is why why are these salamanders here? 
So they had what was thought to be an adaptive radiation coming through Central America into South America. Uh, the, the traditional thinking was the suction cups allowed them to actually climb up the trees so they could exploit a niche that wasn't really occupied. Or they could, or possibly they could have exploited this niche better than uh, some other organism that was in this sort of mid to low canopy uh, niche. Hmm. Well, then there was a paper that actually tested, are these feet adaptive? So they, that, was, that was the baseline question. So you can really detect if, are these traits, are they following any specific pattern? So for example, if, if uh, giraffe necks were uh, adaptive for tall trees, we would expect taller giraffes to be around taller trees. That, that's one way to kind of think about it. Um, yeah. Or you'd expect, uh, you know, maybe a, a different size of giraffe to have a different size neck or whatever. Um, but it would be uh, proportional to their adaptive ability. So if mm -hmm. uh, they're, yeah. Uh, so they did that with the a, with the Bolitoglossa feet, and they looked at uh, their their feet with their suction ability. They actually used a mathematical model to quantify suction ability, uh, and it's a really simple one. <laughs> and it's 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 so cool. Like it's like this is this is the era we live in, 2020. Uh, and what what they found is that. Uh, there is no adaptive ability. This 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 oh. webbing is not adaptive in the slightest. Uh, it's not adaptive for climbing up leaves and getting into the trees whatsoever. And so that's like a wait. So then why do they have these webbed feet? And uh, this is kind of uh, this is actually a really nice tie-in to the start of the podcast about uh you know hey adaptation doesn't mean that it's perfectly adapted for their environment. So what they discovered was. These amphibians started up in North America. They started up there and they started moving southwards. In Central America, uh, they thought to go along the mountain ranges during glaciation cycles, of course, uh, because <clears> when the when the glaciers came in and it was uh, or receded and things got a little too hot, they could either go more north or they could go up in elevation to get to cooler temperatures. So the mountain ranges almost act as uh, highways for genetic diversity. And these Bolitoglossa went down that way. Well, as they went more and more south, it got warmer and warmer and warmer. The cool thing about amphibians is that they are uh, ectotherms. Their metabolism is controlled by the outside temperature, and this affects everything. This affects their, uh, like, like I mentioned, their metabolism. This affects uh, also things like how fast they grow. So Ooh. as they started going south more and more, these amphibians started to, these early salamanders started to develop faster and faster and faster. And if we look at almost all uh, tetrapod embryos uh, as they develop, one of the very last things to happen is that their digits stop being webbed. And they lose oh. that webbing. So these amphibians just developed faster and they just didn't lose the webbing because they were just popped out of that womb a little earlier. Wow. You know, or not womb, but yeah, yeah. They were, they were popped yeah. out a little earlier. Uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> This is actually just sort of this like evolutionarily just eh, it just sort of happened that way. Things got warmer, they came out a little faster, and now they have webbed feet. And, and it just so happens they can kind of climb with it, but it's not really like it's not because they needed to climb or because climbing was such a big deal that they they evolved the the webbed feet had to evolve. It was uh, purely just they're moving southwards, so their morphology responded to an external stimuli. Interesting. Yeah, and it, it's it's a really fascinating tale because it's I, I think it wraps up a lot about what i see with evolution is like every organism has a story right every single organism on this planet has a story contained in millions or thousands of years of evolution mm -hmm. and this one is a story of they went southwards and the ex the environment changed what this entire species group looked like and made them the most speciose group in the most species, most species genus, in the most species family of salamanders, it's it's like, nice. and, and they're by far one of my favorite organisms. They also have like, they, oh my gosh, I didn't even mention it. because they don't have lungs, they have a projectile tongue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, everyone thinks of frogs as having that long tongue that can like grab a fly, and that's not really a thing. In these salamanders, it is. They can do it. I've seen it. It's so cool. Their tongue is can be, I think, a one and a half times their body length fully extended like it's crazy wow I, I need to double check that exact number but yeah it's very very far and so you know th this group is 
they're these tropical salamanders that can suction cup up these uh, <laughs> suction cup up trees and shoot a projectile tongue, and they don't need to breathe. Sort of, they kind of breathe their skin. Uh, they're just like such a cool group of organisms. Um, yeah, yeah. Wow. So I'm I'm just curious yeah, yeah, yeah. with this uh, fast development process. What else is under underdeveloped? Kind of like how they have the webbings. Is right. there anything else that they found that is affected because you know, of this? Yeah, that's an interesting question because in salamanders, uh, pedamorphosis is really common. Uh, maybe not really, really common, but the the the, the retention of juvenile characteristics, uh, pedamorphous. Uh, so this is where you'll see uh, like a like the the oxalotl, which is a, a really mm-hmm. famous example of one. Uh, most salamanders in this uh, Embistema genus that uh, includes the oxalotl they are uh you know they're they're aquatic when they're young and then they develop and they turn into land-based organisms where they lose their gills and everything uh the oxalotl does not they stay aquatic they still have gills and that's pedomorphic that's a juvenile characteristic that exists into adulthood mm. so in this case it is sort of a pedomorphic trait it, it is pedomorphic and for a long time it was just believed that hey it's it's pedomorphic because it was evolutionarily adaptive to be pedomorphic. That, that's kind of what they were saying. But I, I don't know of any other traits, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, there might be something with the ossification of the skull that's oh. ringing a bell, like where the skull is slightly under ossified at first. But I'd have to double check. I, I think there are a few other small minor things, but... Mm, they're escaping me at this moment. Oh yeah, no, I, I'm just curious. I mean, yeah, it seemed yeah, yeah. like um, if 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 it was happening to one sort of trait, it would probably happen to others. Right. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. It's really pretty cool. likely, and it, it could have also been that you know, uh, I think it was 30 million years ago, the Bledoglossa split off from the other salamanders. It could have been that 30 million years ago, there was some trait that was really really good for. Uh, that you needed, you needed suction cup for whatever reason, uh, because I know this group got into South America around 23 to 26 million years ago. It was a very fast, relatively speaking, very fast uh, movement down south. So it could have been back then the suction cupping was really a big deal. It was really needed, but it's no longer needed. Maybe something changed in the environment, some trait changed, and now it's just a feature that they all have. Uh, something mm-hmm. that's called a, a spandrel of evolution is, is what we kind of refer to it as. Um, they they have something that is still there, but it might be used for something else, like suction cup and climbing up trees, uh, where maybe back then it was useful for, you know, complete random guess with no data. Uh, I don't know, suction cupping yeah. onto another salamander during mating, <laughs> during their crazy mating dances, or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, it could be something completely crazy that we could never fully know, but yeah. yeah. It doesn't even have to feel like one, I guess, um, one way of how they live. It could be multiple different things. You know? Exactly. Yeah. It, it could be any number of things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dylan, that was awesome. I really appreciate the yeah. tale. Uh, I also appreciate you being on the podcast. This has been fantastic. Uh, talking a little bit more about like evolution, some in-depth about amphibian evolution, their time, their influence, all of it. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, this was fun. Thanks for letting me uh, nerd out about amphibians. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right, man. Well, thanks. Cheers. Cool. Yeah. That is all for this episode of Everything Steam. I just wanted to take a quick second and thank Dylan for sharing his knowledge and expertise on amphibians, evolution, and just science in general. Definitely make sure you check out his content on Instagram. You can find Dylan at Dylan the Biologist. I would also love to mention my team for their collective efforts to make this show happen. This podcast was edited by Ariel Piermont, marketed by Courtney Page, QC by Pandy Pitt Erickson, and our episode art was created by Gabrielle Edmiston. After the episode, please give our podcast a rating and review on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. We're always looking for feedback, and the rating would greatly help us out in the fight against those algorithms. Lastly, be sure to check us out on all the socials for podcast news, upcoming episodes, and just fun Steam content. Search Everything Steam on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Reddit to join in on the fun. Once again, thank you for listening to Everything Steam. I'm your host, Sam Stanford, and as always, stay curious.